who's responsible for that? Who should be held accountable for the warning systems having failed on this scale? So what are we standing on right now? Six million gallons of pig poop. Very disappointed with the quality of food. So that's Bob Dylan plus Yelp. It was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. I did say abolish with the hat on because why would you keep something around that's a trap door? Poor gentlemen that wrote the 13th Amendment didn't look like the people they were amending. Also, at that point, it was illegal for African Americans to read. So that meant if you actually read the amendment, you'd get locked up and turned to a slave. This right here is the iPlane 1. It's a hydrogen-powered uh, airplane, and this is what our president should be flying in. If he don't look good, we don't look good. This is our president. He has to be the freshest, the flyest, the flyest planes, the best factories. The liberal would try to control a black person through the concept of racism because they know that we are very proud, emotional people. So when I said I like Trump to like someone that's liberal, they'll say, oh, but he's racist. You think racism could control me? Oh, that don't stop me. That's an invisible wall. I don't answer questions in simple sound bites. You, you are tasting a fine wine. It has multiple notes to it. <laughs> now, I think it would be cool for them to be Trump factories because he's a master of industry. He's a builder. And I think it would be cool to have Yeezy ideation centers. Is this a future presidential candidate? Uh, could very well be. Rescue teams in Indonesia are planning to officially end the search for victims on Friday, just over two weeks since an earthquake and tsunami hit the city of Palu. They found more than 2,000 bodies, and officials say 5,000 people are unaccounted for. But they're wrapping the search because rescuers are at risk of disease and unlikely to find survivors. In the village of Potobo, 700 houses were destroyed. Posko safety officer, untuk Haglun, apakah sudah ada pergerakan ganti? Chandra Krishna Rianto got to Palu two days after the earthquake hit. He's been working for 12 days straight. How many people are part of the search and rescue operation here? Ya, yeah, hari ini tim kami uh, berjumlah tim sar gabungan berjumlah 128 personil. I just can't even understand how you would begin to try and retrieve bodies from this destruction. Kita sudah melihat akses ini uh, membutuhkan waktu yang uh, cukup lama karena sebelumnya di sini adalah uh, puing-puing yang berserakan dan tidak ada jalan untuk melakukan proses uh, moving dari korban. That's another one of the bodies. Ya, itu. Ini adalah salah satu jenazah yang ditemukan oleh tim kami dan sedang dievakuasi menuju titik pengumpulan korban. Uh, And how many bodies are you finding every day? Dari hari pertama sampai dengan hari ini bervariasi jumlahnya. Namun keseluruhan sampai dengan hari terakhir kemarin kami sudah menemukan sebanyak 149 korban dalam posisi meninggal dunia. When you come to a place like this, talk me through the emotions you feel. Saya memposisikan diri uh, saya sebagai korban. Jadi uh, saya memposisikan diri bahwa uh, korban itu adalah uh, seandainya itu keluarga saya. Jadi saya akan berusaha bagaimana korban tersebut bisa kita evakuasi dan kita selamatkan. Palu is in the province of central Sulawesi, which lies on a major fault line. The magnitude 7.5 earthquake struck at 6.02 p.m. local time. Over the next 30 minutes, three tsunami waves, amplified and concentrated by the narrow bay, hit the city of 330,000 people. The earthquake is believed to have caused a phenomenon called liquefaction, where pressure pushes groundwater to the surface, turning soil into liquid, destroying entire neighborhoods, burying residents alive. 
Early warning systems failed en masse. Buoy and tidal gauges that read sea level changes were either not working or too far away. 78,000 people have been displaced. Survivors in remote towns waited days for clean water and electricity. The government says it's turning its focus to getting them help. Local politicians have been elusive and defensive. Who's responsible for that? Who should be held accountable for the warning systems having failed on this scale? Ya, sementara kementerian-kementerian yang terkait, ya kementerian terkait, ya warning system BMKG, kemudian pada saat kejadian gempa semua jaringan listrik mati, drop. Kemudian komunikasi drop. Jadi biar kita mitigasi seperti apa, ya. Tapi kalau kondisi yang dihadapi gelap gulita tidak bisa ngapa-ngapain. Biar kita peringati teriak-teriak nggak mungkin, ya tidak bisa seperti itu. Do you think the government response has been adequate? Ya luar biasa. Respon pemerintah pusat, pemerintah daerah, provinsi dan kabupaten luar biasa. Ya artinya di waktu yang sembilan hari ini pelan-pelan sudah bisa uh, pulih uh, ekonomi masyarakat, ber, apa, sudah listrik. Uh, jaringan, uh, apa, komunikasi juga sudah semua, semua sudah mulai pulih. But the government doesn't plan to bring every neighborhood back. They're considering turning Balaroa into a mass grave. Itu rumah itu. It's the first time Zainab Lamangasa has been able to return to her home. The earthquake killed her son, and she's still in shock. Rumah tak goyang, jadi pas saya berjalan jatuh. Jatuh keluar, ini tanah kata putar begini, tak putar langsung lari saya kemarin sini. How did you manage to escape? Saya panggil semua anakku, keluar, keluar. Nah, orang cari jalan di belakang, apa ini sudah runtuh. Saya ambil semua orang baru saya bawa ke sana. Kalau keluarga saya cuma satu, kalau balor ini banyak meninggal, dibawa. Like thousands of other survivors, Zainab now lives in a makeshift camp, sleeping on the floor with her large family. Even if she could return home, she's not sure she'd want to. Cucuku banyak betul. Tinggal baju di badan. Kita butuh tempat tinggal. Itu. Yang itu terutama, tempat tinggal. Tidak mungkin kita begini terus. Tidur di tanah begini ke sini. Iya. From the very beginning, the Trump administration has equated immigrants with a criminal threat. And it's made the San Francisco Bay Area into its main adversary in the fight against sanctuary cities. The claim is that when a place like Oakland protects people from getting deported, it's letting dangerous criminals go free. That argument was on full display earlier this year, when Oakland's mayor, Libby Schaaf, publicly warned that ICE was about to launch a large-scale operation in late February. Residents should know that they do not have an obligation to open their doors if an ICE official knocks. That sent the administration into a tailspin. Those are 800 wanted criminals that are now at large in that community. So here's my message to Mayor Schaaf. How dare you? How dare you needlessly endanger the lives of our law enforcement officers to promote a radical open borders agenda? Things snowballed from there. A spokesman for ICE quit over Sessions' claim about 800 wanted criminals, which he said was a lie. And ICE later took back the claim entirely. Then 12 Senate Democrats signed a letter demanding to know exactly how many dangerous criminals had actually been arrested. We now know the answer to that question. Through a Freedom of Information request, Vice News got detailed data on the criminal backgrounds of the people that ICE arrested in this raid, which was called Operation Keep Safe 2. Here's what we found. 233 people were arrested across Northern and Central California. 122 of them had criminal convictions. That means the rest, almost half of everyone arrested, had no criminal record whatsoever. Now let's break down the ones that did have a record. The largest category, 29 people, had a record that consisted of traffic offenses. 
19 people had drug offenses, but that can mean anything from trafficking to simple possession. So let's look at what ICE calls level one offenses. Those are the most serious crimes like homicide and kidnapping. 47 people, about 20% of those arrested, had level one convictions, but about half of them were from more than 10 years ago. That leaves exactly 22 people, 9% of the 233 who were arrested, who committed a serious crime in the last decade. We showed the data to John Sandwick, who was an official at Homeland Security and acting director of ICE under Obama. There's a gap here between the rhetoric and the way in which this operation is described and the net results in terms of how many individuals were apprehended who pose an active public safety threat to the U.S. And I think ICE needs to do a better job of focusing on people who are at large and in communities, right, who have serious criminal histories. And in some cases, they, you know, there's other evidence that they're, they pose an active danger to society. I think my concern here with this operation is that the targeting is broad. They went far beyond any kind of rational parameters. ICE declined to comment on these specific numbers. They just referred us to their original press release for the operation. Under Trump, unlike under Obama, ICE is open about the fact that it considers every undocumented immigrant fair game for arrest and deportation. But the political argument against sanctuary cities is still essentially about public safety about letting ICE take dangerous criminals off the streets. And that's the argument that starts to break apart when you look at the numbers. After battering the Florida panhandle and killing at least six people, Hurricane Michael has weakened to a tropical storm. But as it moves north through North Carolina, it's now dumping rain on the same areas ravaged by Hurricane Florence last month. More flooding isn't just a challenge for families hoping to rebuild. It could also pose a danger to the water supply. North Carolina is the second largest pork producer in the country. And its 9.4 million hogs produce around 10 billion gallons of waste each year most of which gets stored in open lagoons. When storms cause those lagoons to flood, the surrounding communities can literally find themselves in deep shit. When Hurricane Floyd hit in 1999, pig waste from swamped lagoons wreaked havoc on the state's waterways. And during Florence, more than 50 lagoons flooded again. Everyone in North Carolina knows that pig poop can be a big problem, but there's not a lot of agreement about how to solve it. Morris Murphy takes care of 15,000 hogs. And like many other farmers here in Duplin County, he puts their shit in massive open pits, five of them. This is pretty much standard industry-wide. You know, I get the question, you know, you know, all technology is advanced in all different ways. Why is it not hitting the farm? Y'all know anything I got with that? If it ain't fixed, don't broke. <laughs> it's not broke, don't fix it, you know. The fill level in the lagoons is only allowed to get to a certain point. And to keep it there, Murphy uses the excess to fertilize his fields, using what amounts to the world's smelliest aerosol spray. The sprinkler is rotating back and forth, and that takes care of all. Uh, you set it on for whatever speed you want, so we know how many gallons of nitrogen we're putting per acre. All that's calculated, and it's fairly simple. During Hurricane Florence, Morris's lagoons didn't flood, and the hog waste remained within his property. In his view, the system works, even in emergencies. And everybody saw this one coming. I mean, the industry as a whole, everybody done a fantastic job. Is this the best way to take care of the waste the hogs produce and then turn it into nutrients? It's the best way to my knowledge. Uh, if there's other, like I said, if there's other ways to do it, I'm open to listen to it. To put a cover on this, on this lagoon right here, this size would probably be $300,000. I got three of them here. I got two more. That'd be a million and a half dollars. I couldn't survive it. Personally, I think the system's fine. Somebody needs to come here and point to me and prove to me that what I'm doing is bad for the environment before I feel like I need to change it. So what are we standing on right now? Six million gallons of pig poop. How ready do you think this lagoon is for Hurricane Michael? Very. 
Yeah, we could get 40 inches of rain and it wouldn't make any difference. Tom Butler runs 8,000 hogs in Lillington. A decade ago, he radically overhauled how his farm deals with waste. We've said several times uh, during the first year, what have we gotten into? And that was due mainly to the odor and to the amount of waste we produced. In 2008, Butler decided to take advantage of now defunct government funding programs to install airtight covers over his lagoons. The covers keep the odor down and prevent flooding. An operating system converts the trapped biogas into electricity. One reason why more farmers haven't adopted this solution is a quirk in the way the hog farming system works. Big agricultural conglomerates hire the farmers as contract growers. It's the conglomerates who own the pigs, but the farmers who own the shit. Meaning they don't have the incentive or the cash on hand to change the system on a larger scale. And dealing with waste seems like a pretty expensive problem. The biggest expense for us would be if I wanted to close the farm right now, had everything paid off, was absolutely disgusted and wanted to leave, it would cost me $320,000 out of my pocket to just close these two. So you rent the pigs and you own the waste? Yes. We didn't have any idea of what we were taking on because we weren't educated in waste management. I'd say 95% of the growers that signed contracts were had no education in waste management. We have a system that's not working. We Believe Survivors became a mantra for Democrats protesting Kavanaugh's confirmation. But one woman who's made accusations against a prominent Democrat isn't being heard. And he looked at me, goes, hey, you hear me? And then he looked at me, he goes, bitch, get the out of my house. And he started trying to drag me off the bed. That woman is Karen Monahan. And she's accusing Congressman Keith Ellison, the vice chairman of the Democratic National Committee and a candidate for Minnesota Attorney General, of physical and verbal abuse. Ellison and Monahan dated for about three years. She says that incident in August of 2016 was the only time Ellison was violent towards her. Monahan's allegations have a lot of parallels to the charges made by Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. For one, neither pressed charges at the time of the alleged attack something that was used to raise doubts about both women's claims. Both Kavanaugh and Ellison have dismissed the allegations and said they were politically motivated. Here's what Ellison said when he was asked at a PBS debate in September if he was confident there wouldn't be any more allegations against him. Look, you know, in this political environment, you know, I don't know what somebody might cook up, but I can tell you that there is absolutely nobody that I'm aware of who's, who has any sort of who's threatening or suggesting or has ever, ever made a prior accusation. Both men faced other accusers too. After Dr. Ford's allegations were made public, other women came forward with their own. And Ellison had faced a previous assault allegation in 2006 from a Minnesota woman who wrote in an op-ed that she called the police after the congressman came to her house uninvited, argued with her and, quote, grabbed me and pushed me out of the way. Ellison denied it ever happened. With the allegations against both Kavanaugh and Ellison, there was an outside investigation that didn't really corroborate anything. In both cases, those defending the accusers called the investigations a sham. The state Democratic Party hired an outside counsel to investigate Monaghan's charges against Ellison. But Andrew Parker, Karen Monaghan's lawyer, says the firm does business with the party. A clear conflict of interest bias and prejudgment has to be considered because this is a law firm that the state Democratic Party chooses. They protect and represent the Democratic Party. And the alleged abuser here is a celebrity leader of the progressive movement in the Democratic Party. One key difference? Unlike Blasey Ford, Monaghan says she has hard evidence that the assault took place a video she took on her cell phone as it happened. Her son says he's seen it, but she won't release it to the public, 
or to the attorney investigating her claims. But maybe the biggest, most glaring difference is how the Democratic Party has handled the two different scandals. National Democrats rallied around Dr. Ford, calling for Kavanaugh to withdraw his nomination over the allegations. There's been crickets from party leaders about Ellison. Remember the last time a prominent Minnesota Democrat faced allegations of sexual misconduct? National Democrats were pretty quick to call for then-Senator Al Franken to resign, and he was pretty quick to do it. The generous explanation for their silence this time is that there's enough doubt surrounding the allegations against Keith Ellison that they're not worth acting on. The cynical explanation? Here's what Monahan's attorney told me. This is all about selective support, depending on whose team the alleged abuser is on. It's not about the women, it's about power, and that's very sad. The most recent poll of the attorney general race gives Ellison just a five-point lead over the Republican. If he drops out, Democrats would lose their best-known candidate and potentially their strongest shot at keeping a seat that's been in Democratic hands for decades. I think that gives us some direction on like the general tone of this. This needs to be sentimental. It needs to be a kind of like a uh, perfect day type vibe. It's such a perfect day to get married to a Muppet. Botnik is a creative studio that uses predictive text and other kinds of machine learning to write stuff. Human machine collaborative writing that wouldn't have come from a person and wouldn't have come from a machine, but weirdly does come from the combination of the two together. Each song pulls from a bunch of different source materials and synthesizes them. So this is Sesame Street lyrics, lyrics to the Velvet Underground, and uh, a collection of wedding announcements in the New York Times. You can never understand my love Because marriage is an alligator A lot of coverage of AI frames it as what if the robots get better than us at doing everything? Isn't this scary? We're not trying to speed up writing that already exists. We're trying to make a new kind of writing that would only come from this combination of people and machines. The program we use is called VoiceBox. I wrote VoiceBox based on what I understood of the phone predictive text keyboard. So as the person operating this machine, your task is at every step of the sentence, choose a word that could lead to a good line or whatever you want to write. I remember being shocked by the American friend. Oh. I love art that has humor and maybe a subtext of like social commentary mixed in with it, and then music, like that's basically everything I like in one package. You wonder where everything comes from. So it's cyborg writing, you know, it's not it's not automated, it's not AI, um, it's not actually a bot, and it's also not um, just us faking how a robot would write, getting things wrong on purpose, it's, yeah, if, to me, like I said, the benchmark is uh, something, a third thing that neither, uh, neither entity could create on its own. For the lead single on this album, the two source texts we used were all of Morrissey's lyrics on one hand, and all Amazon customer reviews of the P90X workout DVD system on the other, and wrote it into a song. Just to see results, I really started to cry. And I think it's fair to say I've gotten bored with this desire to get ripped. This is the second stop on the Songularity Tour, which is a tour to promote Botanik's first album. We're going to subject Baby Castles to another predictive text song. This one by one of the original 60s kings of protest music, Bob Dylan, in combination with negative Yelp reviews of 4th Street restaurants. I ain't sure if anyone would think this place is good. Definitely won't be coming back. Very 
disappointed with the quality of food. And I was very disappointed with the staff. There's something about comedy writing. The first step is asking, what are all the words that get me to that voice? Not impressed, I would not recommend. Voice box is pretty good at giving you a bunch of words that put you in a voice. And then you're the one who's good at figuring out what to do with them. So that's Bob Dylan plus Yelp. <laughs> <laughs>